Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 21, as we continue the story here, we see last week, if you remember, David was on the run, and he had left out of fear of Saul. Now what's interesting, as we get to the end of this chapter, the parts that were just read, if you look at the last phrase that was just read here in verse 15, it says, Shall this fellow come into my house? Now, I want to talk today about whose house do you run to? In a time of trouble in your life, when disaster strikes and troubles are there, where do you go? Where do you run to? Do you run to the house of the Lord? Or do you run to a worldly house? We see both in this chapter, which is really interesting, of David. First, he goes into the house of the Lord. Then he departs yet again, and he ends up going to the house of Gath, which is very fascinating. I, years ago, I worked for a gentleman, and he was a, for a lack of a better term, he was a, a prepper. Who knows what I'm talking about? An end times prepper. I mean, he had the bug out bag. He had the bug out car. He had one, like, he had a container dug down in the hill with running water and solar hook. I mean, he had some plans. He was ready to go. And he often instructed me and says, now listen, you're a good friend and you work with me on these projects. And as I've instructed all of my family, if it hits the fan. Now, by the way, let's rewind. This was when ba Obama had became president. And every uh, God-fearing person says, you know, this fellow right here, he might just be the Antichrist. He sure does look evil, right? And that, at this time, he said, listen, if it happens, if they come after us, we have a, a rendezvous point. We have a predetermined destination no matter where you are. If it all goes crazy, everybody go to the hills, go to this spot. You know where it's at. We'll be safe there. We'll work together. We'll have our own little community. We'll be okay, right? Uh, when, here's what I want to ask you and what I want you to consider. In your life, when disaster strikes, whose house do you go to? Do you go to the house of Gath? The house of Egypt, Babylon, do you go to the world? Or do you go to the house of the Lord? When trials come and life happens and your health goes and you're frustrated with something, how do you respond? Well, I'm going to go see what this psychologist said and I'm going to go to the physician. I'm going to go to the financial consultant. Or do you go to your father's house? And I really want to talk about that. I want to encourage you to run home. Go to dad's home. Go to dad's house, right? That's the thought. Uh, first, I want to look at the mistake that he made in verse 10, if you would. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. Now, he's moving for the wrong reasons. Are we to fear man or are we to fear God? Now, if we fear God, we have nothing else to be afraid of. We don't have to be afraid of sticks and stones and snakes and storms as long as we're afraid of God, right? We, it's funny, just this week, uh, we're, we're, our, our rental house, we've been living for a few years, across the street, the folks there, they, refuse, they won't cut their trees down, they can't afford it, and every storm something falls, and it's like, this one piece is going to land on one of our vehicles one day, we just know it, it's going to happen. And it happened this week, but... The Lord provided. I mean, my wife was gone uh, moving things to the new house, praise the Lord. And so, it, you know, we're, our driveway's been blocked, and I mean, everything's disastrous in the front. You can't get through the street, all this kind of stuff. And I've often, I mean, the girls get, you know, what about that tree? You know, there's another tree in the backyard. And I always tell them, hey, whose tree is that? Who made the tree? Who made the storm? If we're afraid of God, we have nothing to fear. God can allow a tree to fall on your house and break your house so that He can move you somewhere where you can minister to somebody that needs to be ministered to. God can do things miraculously, and we need to get rid of this idea that everything should be sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes disaster comes for God to work out His, the glory of His name through the whole process when we submit to Him. So he starts moving for fear of a man. He was the wrong motivation, right? He says, David arose and fled that day for the fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And then he goes to the wrong place. Now, Gath. Who else was from Gath? Who can tell me? Goliath. Goliath of Gath. Now, wait a minute. He goes to the giants of the world instead of going to God? 
something's wrong. He's moving for the wrong reason. So it happens, verse 11. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? So when you're moved for the wrong reason, and you move to the wrong place, next thing you know you're going to find yourself with the wrong people, and you're going to realize you don't belong. You know what happens? Okay, you get saved. You are called out. You are to be sanctified. That means set apart for a holy reason. Your body is to be used to serve God. That's God's will for your life, period. And when you decide to go hang out with your old buddies and do things that we would expect a worldly, sinful, unsaved person to do, and maybe you, maybe you go on down to the bar and you just hang out with somebody from the bar, and they're like, you don't belong here. Oh, this is the guy that tried to invite me to church. And now he wants to sit down next to me and have a drink with me? David had a reputation as belonging to the Lord, and now he comes to the house of Achish of Gath to serve there. How bizarre. He was our enemy, and he's going to come to us and ask for help? It's not right. It's not natural. You're a Christian. You should not look like the world. You should look more and more and more like Christ every single day. That's God's will for you. And look, I know it's not easy. I know it takes work. I know you need God's help. I, I get all that. And it takes time. But look, we ought to have some determination and we ought to have some discipline that we're going to do whatever we have to do to purge our lives and look more like Christ so that we can preach the gospel with integrity without somebody saying, oh, it's another one of those hypocritical Christians. I had a buddy years ago, and he quit drinking. He got saved, but he wouldn't quit smoking pot. And he, he would tell me, well, well, hey, brother, don't tell me. <laughs> and he would go preach at other guys that drank. Oh, you can't drink. And they would say, you smoke pot all the time. You're a pothead. You can't do anything without smoking pot. Everybody knows it. You can't see clearly. You stir, I mean, you slur your words. You think you're better off when you smoke. And it's shameful. Everybody knows that you're just a pothead. He was saved. But his reputation was, well, I'm going to hold on to my sin, and I'd rather live for my sin than to live for Christ. As Christians, God gives us the Holy Spirit so we can begin to change. And that's His will for us. So he's in the wrong place with the wrong people. He doesn't belong. Verse 12. And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. Now there's more fear. Now he's afraid. Uh-oh, they found me out. They know who I am and what I do. Verse 13, And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad. Now, this is the result of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, moved by the wrong reason, and now you're full of fear. You're going to fake like you're crazy. Or you're going to do things that aren't normal. That's not you. It's not your personality. And it's going to drive you crazy. When he says feign, that means to fake it. When he says mad in the Bible, that means crazy. So he realized, uh-oh, they know who I am. They know I don't belong here. Oh, no. Oh, I'm just crazy. I'm crazy. That's what he's going to do. He's going to start acting like he's crazy. Craziness is the result of making these bad decisions. Uh, going to the wrong house. Remember, this is the theme for tonight. Whose house do you go to in a time of trouble? I know what I'll do. I'll call up my old buddy, one I used to kick around with. We went to school together. He doesn't live for God, but we're buddies. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the door. Right? And scrabbled on the door of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. I'm not going to give you a demonstration of that. I think you can understand that pretty well. Okay? And he's like making noises like all of a sudden like he's a rat eating at the doorpost of the door. And they're like, what is this guy? He went crazy. Verse 14. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then have he brought him to me? He's rejected. He's rejected. Well, you go to the wrong house, you go to the wrong place, you look for the wrong solution, you're going to be rejected ultimately. And the goal is that we just don't go there and have to go through these processes of error. He gets rejected. And then comes shame, verse 15. Have I need of madmen? They have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence. Shall this fellow come into my house? This king, Goliath's king, is now recognizing that David, the one that killed Goliath, is just a crazy madman? How bizarre. 
shameful to his reputation because he responded incorrectly. If you would go to Proverbs 25. Go with me please to Proverbs chapter 25. You see, we're all going to have a day of distress or trouble. We're all going to need some help at some point and some time. The goal is that now we would recognize God has a perfect plan for us and that even in disaster, if we'll go to the Lord and commit it to the Lord, give it to God, if we'll just do that, then we can have victory and we won't make a fool of ourselves. Proverbs 25, look at the end, look at verse 26. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. He's saying it just doesn't make sense. We're supposed to have the fountain of life in us, and we're going to go and bow down before the wicked and ask them for help. Go to Psalm 23. Go to Psalm 23. Uh, what I love about preaching is that I get to look at great men of the faith like David, and we get to look at his errors and mistakes, and Lord willing, we can learn from them because we don't always learn from them, and sometimes we repeat them. But what we do get to see oftentimes in the good ones is that David learned, and then he's going to instruct us to not make the mistake like he did early on in his life. David failed by going to the wrong house here. Uh, the answer was to go to the house of the Lord and uh, seek the Lord, and that's where the answer is. David didn't always do that. So later in his life, when he had God's blessing and protection and provision, he was filled with the Spirit. He gave instruction to go to the house of the Lord because he made a mistake by not doing that at least once or twice or three times we'll see as we continue through the book of Samuel. Now Psalm 23, of course, is famous. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, our great shepherd and He's our, the bishop of our souls, right? Uh, but look at verse 4, Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. <coughs> He's saying, when, when times get hard, I have nothing to be afraid of. God's going to take care of me. When I go through the valley of the shadow of death. Notice he says there that the rod and the staff. Now the rod is used for correction, and the staff is used for instruction. When we correct, we're supposed to also instruct. We're supposed to reprove. We're supposed to give a verbal warning and understanding, here's why you're in trouble. Here's what you did wrong, and here's the right thing to do. That's, that's instruction and correction in a nutshell. They're supposed to go hand in hand. If you forget one, you're going to have an out-of-balance response. So God uses His rod on us and his staff to comfort us. Verse 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. He has more than he needs. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, this is one that can be sung. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen, he's trying to get us to realize the biggest thing of all he wants in life is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David was a man of war. He did not want to stay at war forever. David was a man of skill. David was a shepherd over the sheep. David was a leader of the people. He did not talk about that stuff. What he wanted to do was dwell in the house of the Lord for the rest of his life. And that ought to be our goal. He messed up and went to the wrong place. And he's trying to instruct us right here. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How can I get goodness and mercy to follow me and bless me? Well, get in church. It's pretty simple. Why? What's in church? Well, let's take a look. Go to Psalm 27. Go to Psalm 27. Have you guys ever noticed, and uh, don't raise your hand if your spouse is next to you, and certainly don't elbow them, but you ever notice that like uh, the, a fight happens before church? 
or something seems to get in the way to prevent you. Right, and, and it's like it's one of those things where you get frustrated and you're like, I don't even want to go now, knowing that there's a huge blessing for going and God works through that. And um, it's happened in my life and I, I'm sure it's happened in yours. Maybe you start budding heads because your spirits are uh, beginning to rub against each other and the devil's trying to get a foothold in your family and if he can just get you to not go to church, then you won't get the victory. You won't get that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David said, I just want to get closer to God. I want to see more of God. I want to hear more of His Word. And we're talking about spiritual growth this month, and it really is all about the Word. David prophesied, and we're reading what the Holy Spirit spake to us through him. So what can we get? What can we get when we go to the house of the Lord? We're in Psalm 27. Look at verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? This is so uh, relative, uh, so uh, irrelevant rather, to what we're reading in 1 Samuel 21. He was afraid of Saul, so he ran to Goliath's king for help. Well, now that's really messed up. That's bad thinking. Why would you do that? Well, obviously he wasn't led of the Lord. He was led of his own spirit, of his own fear. Here he's telling us, whom shall I fear? He wasn't afraid of the giant before. Now he's afraid of Saul. He's wavering. But notice this phrase in the middle of verse 1 where he says, The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the strength of my life. If I said, hey, what is the strength of your life? If you tell me, well, I drink, I drink these uh, monster energy drinks. That's my strength. I drink Red Bulls. I'd say, well, that's no real strength at all, right? You say, well, it's because I do 100 push-ups first thing in the morning. That's what keeps my life strong. You say, no, that's because of my vitamins. I take this vitamin and that vitamin and this supplement and that so No, it's because of the doctor. He gave me this pill and that pill and this shot. I'm saying, man, you've got a false hope in the wrong thing. The Bible is telling us that God is the strength of your life. What a timely thing on a Wednesday night when we're praying for the needs of one another. And there's many physical needs in this building, some that I know of that they didn't speak up for themselves. Well, God knows your needs, but we come here to strengthen each other and pray to God together. And He is the strength of my life. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing to write on, your, on a card and put in the dashboard of your vehicle? The Lord is the strength of my life. Wouldn't that be great on a wall, on a picture, on a banner, on a postcard? The Lord is the strength of my life. I don't have enough strength to get through it. I know, but I know who does. The Lord is your strength. Verse 2, when the wicked, even mine enemies, and my foes come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host would encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. He's, and now look, he had victories from David, and, or from Saul's men, and Saul, and the Philistines. He's given us a story, but he says, in this will I be confident. What's the source of his confidence? One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Where's his confidence? That I know if I can get to the house of the Lord and do what he's going to tell us next, that he will be the strength of my life. He's going to give us a couple points. I wanted to point out something here first, though. He says, to behold the beauty of the Lord. When you come to church, I know it's not for my beauty. <laughs> it's for the beauty of the word. It's not to worship me or to honor me. It's the Lord. It's not so you can get up here and we all hear how great you sing. It's because I want to sing to the Lord. I want to praise Him. It's interesting that he says, to behold the beauty of the Lord. This is coming from a man that fell because he was guilty of beholding the beauty of a woman that didn't belong to him, and he took action in sin and fell. And here he says, no, no, I want to get close to the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and 
to inquire in his temple. We need to ask God some things, and here's the answer book. In verse 5 he says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. Whose house do you run to? Do you run to the house of the Lord where he will hide you in his pavilion? He says, In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Now listen, we, we kind of have it where we, I, I gave, I, I gave an offering, right? I gave my tithe. I gave 10% back to what God gave me. Here he says, I, I want the sacrifice of joy. You know, in the New Testament it says the sacrifice of praise. Are you sacrificing your energy to sing unto the Lord? If you say, well, I just don't have a, a strong voice, that's okay, sing anyway. If you say, well, I, I just don't have a beautiful voice. Hey, brother, amen, me too. Sing anyway. He doesn't say make a beautiful sound. He says make a joyful sound. And God wants us to come together and show our joy for what God has done. And one of the ways we do it is by praising Him through song. If you want a happier existence, well, come to the house of the Lord. Realize that this is the strength of your life. Realize that He's going to set you back up. He's going to encourage you. Why? Because we're going to do a few things. We're going to sing to the Lord. We're going to express our joy for what He's done for us. I use the example, I mean, you get one flat tire and do you praise the Lord for the three that are full? No sooner did I preach that the next day, Brother Eric texted me and he's like, Brother, I just got a flat tire and if it wasn't for your sermon yesterday, I'd be mad. And he said, I'm thanking God for all He's done for us. And I mean, amen, right? I mean, well, I mean, we all have some needs in our life, whether it be monetary or physical. And here we are tonight. We're here to hear the Word of God, but it's not just that. We're here to sing praises unto the Lord. And if you'll do it out of a pure heart, you say, I'm not good, I'm not loud, I can't carry a tune, it does not matter. Lift up your voice unto the Lord. Give a sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. A sacrifice of joy unto the Lord. Can you visualize bringing a sacrifice of some form, an animal or, or money or grains or goods or something? Like, I'm giving this to God. I'm giving my best to God. And he says, will you do it with your words? Will you do it with your words? Will you praise the Lord and show others that you have joy because of what God is doing for you? Somebody says, wow, things are going really well for you. What would you do? I had a guy say, what, did you win the lottery? I said, no, God answered my prayers. Thank God He's answered my prayers. I didn't deserve it. God's doing something awesome and I'm humbled to be part of it. Look at the rest of this verse. Verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 6. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. I will sing praises unto the Lord. You ought to lift up your voice. You need to sing. If you say, I don't know the words, you do the best you can. Because you're doing it for God. You're not doing it to show us that you sing. You're not doing it because you, you, you're, you know, just to show off that you're participating. You're singing to God. And when you praise Him with your mouth, He gives you joy. He says in verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. You know, most of the time we go straight to that. God, I'm praying again. It's for the same thing. God, I have this prayer. Answer me. Hear me. Have mercy on me. Help me. But we've skipped the parts about trusting Him for strength, going to His house, having a desire to be in His house with His people, to hear His Word, to sing His praises. We skip all that and we go straight to, I asked for something. Where's my answer? He will answer. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. You notice that point of humility. Have mercy on me. You know, there's times we come with prayer and that's a good time to say, Lord, is it me? Is there something else? Is there something you're working on me about? Is there something I've done or said or I'm holding back that I won't let go? 
When we have a prayer for God, when we have a need in life, sometimes God uses that so we'll get close to Him and purge our life, pull the weeds out of our garden so He can grow some good fruit in our life. While we're in, verse, in chapter 27, look at verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I, I talked about this recently. To wait, it does not mean sit around. Well, I prayed, now I'm just waiting on an answer. It, it doesn't really mean that. It means, as the example is, a five-star waiter. When you go to a fancy restaurant and they come to your table and they're there to serve you, you spill something, they have a towel. You take a sip out of water and they, they pour it back up. You say, where's the bread? Here's the bread. Where's the meat? I mean, they're on it. They're taking care of you. Well, that's how we are. We're supposed to wait on the Lord in a sense. It means to serve Him. It's to look for His desire. It's to look for His will. It's to look for an opportunity to glorify Him. That's what these waiters and waitresses do. I mean, they do it for a, monet for a tip. Boy, they know if they can keep that, that glass of sweet tea full and you're happy, boy, they can get a $5 tip. We're told to wait on the Lord in a way of serve Him, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That doesn't mean wait around and see what happens. That means get busy serving Him, find His will, work it out in your life, purge yourself for His glory, have some courage, believe His promises, and He'll strengthen your heart. He'll give you the boldness that you need. This He was confident in. If you would, um, go to, back to 1 Samuel 21. Let's take a look at this. So we see that David initially makes the right decision by going to the house of the Lord. Later he makes a bad decision and goes to the house of uh, the king of Gath. Let's look at what happens when he goes to the house of the Lord. So he goes to the house of the Lord. There's a priest there. He begins to talk with him. Um, and let's just pick up in verse number 3. 1 Samuel 21, verse number 3. Now therefore, what is this under thine hand? Give me five loaves. I'm sorry. Uh, what is under thine hand. Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand or what there is present. He says, I need some food. I got, he probably had five guys with him. Give me some loaves of bread or whatever you've got. And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. Well, what's he talking about? That's kind of interesting. Remember, he's speaking to a priest of the Lord who kept the service of the Lord and in the temple of the Lord, they had what was called show bread. It's going to give us that word in just a minute. It was bread that was put out for a show. So you're showing off or what? I don't get it. Well, what, what it was, there were 12 loaves of bread. They set in stacks of six, six by two, and they replenished them every single day. They made new bread. And they would set this bread out. It was unleavened bread. Leaven is a picture of sin. Leaven is bacteria. Okay, so when you make bread at home, it's the bacteria that goes in between and makes those bubbles. It's a reaction and it begins uh, to rise. Well, this was unleavened bread. It was a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was called the continual bread. It was always there. There was always a dozen loaves on a table, a golden table, in the house of the Lord. It was always there every day without fail. The only time it wasn't is when they picked it up to put a new dozen down. They did it every single day. That bread would then be fed to the priest that did the service of the Lord, okay? So that's the bread we're dealing with. He says, there's, there's no common bread here. When he says common, he doesn't mean like commonplace. And we're not talking about Little Debbie's you can buy anywhere. They're real common. That's not what he means, okay? Common means, it actually means unholy. In fact, in the New Testament, he uses the phrase, where was it uh, Peter that said, uh, nothing common nor unclean. He's saying there is no unclean or average or uh, uh, bread that has been risen with uh, yeast. He says we only have that holy bread. It is hallowed. It is sanctified. It is set apart as a picture of the continual salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what it was pointing to. Jesus as the bread of life. It was always there. Uh, so that, that was what the symbol was in the Old Testament. He says, I don't have any regular bread. I don't have any unclean bread. All I have is this holy bread. Are you guys at least clean? 
And you know, if you go back in Exodus where they told them, set yourselves apart, don't come unto your wives for three days. So he's kind of referencing an Old Testament passage there. Um, so that was the statement in verse 4, verse 5. Look what David says. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us for about these three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. Now that's an interesting statement. He says, the bread is in a manner common. Hear me out. If my wife made bread, which she does occasionally, if she made some bread and it was unleavened bread, and it was clean without bacteria, and we set it apart, it's holy, and we set it down on this table, and it's been setting here all day. Is it still without bacteria? Well, so there's bacteria in the air that begins to affect it. So David's kind of saying, well, in a manner it is common, because <laughs> it's fulfilled its course of being out for a day. Although it is sanctified, and we've been set apart as well, it's interesting, it just makes me think about how the Lord Jesus Christ, where He came in sinful flesh. It literally says that God came in sinful flesh. Now, he didn't sin. He was sinless in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came in a body, and it's neat that that's kind of what that picture of that bread was. So David's answer was, the bread is holy, and yet it's common, even though it were sanctified today. So he has a very interesting statement here. Uh, look at verse 6. So the priest gave him the hallowed bread, for there was no bread there, but the show bread that was taken up from before him, uh, from before the Lord, to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So they took it away and put new bread down, verse 7. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. Uh, if you would go with me to Matthew 12. We're going to talk about the bread for just a minute. Uh, Doeg, we'll talk more about him next week. Doeg the Edomite, he was detained before the Lord. It doesn't tell us why, but obviously he was in sin or something. There was something else going on there, why he was stuck or held back there. Now, when we go to the house of the Lord, what can we expect? Well, we can expect to find some bread. We can expect to find some bread. Are you guys in Matthew 12? Are you going there with me? Matthew chapter 12. If you would look at verse number 1, it says, and at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Now let's be clear. There is no law about gleaning on the Sabbath day. The gleaning was a gift. It was free. He's trying to say, oh, you did something unlawful. No, here's what was unlawful, to work on the Sabbath day because it tells us in Hebrews 9, we have entered in, or Hebrews 4 rather, we've entered into His rest. Jesus finished the work and it was all by His works. I'm not saved by my works, it was by His works. So that was the picture of that law. The Pharisee said, it's not lawful to do that. They were freely gleaning, which was lawful. They were not working. So for starters, their accusation was wrong. However, look at how Jesus handled it. Verse 3, But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest. That bread was set apart. It was illegal, if you will, for him to eat it. He did it anyway. Verse 5, or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Do you know what that means? The priests were commanded to do work on the Sabbath day. Now, we don't keep a Sabbath. We are not, Sunday is not a Christian Sabbath. We should, there is a good law that it's good to have a rest day. That principle is true, whether we're talking about a field of land or a man that works. So a rest day is a good thing for the body, naturally. God's commandment of keeping the Sabbath holy was not repeated in the New Testament. It's clear that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Sabbath just as He fulfilled the Passover. He was the temple. He was the high priest. He was the sacrificial lamb. Like everything pointed to Jesus, okay? So all of those cardinal ordinances have been fulfilled. In fact, uh, if you will, the Sabbath was given by Moses 
and it was completed by Jesus. That was a 1,500-year span of history. Out of 6,000 years, God had set apart a time where he wanted a tabernacle, which became a temple, and then another temple, and he had the Sabbath, and he had the Passover for less than 1,500 years. So this is not a permanent commandment. Although God rested on the seventh day, and we see places where people rested, we are not commanded today to keep Saturday a Sabbath day to keep it a holy day. I want to be clear, because there is a movement today, and it is anti-Christ. It is the Hebrew Roots Movement. It is the Restore Judaism Movement. It's the Seventh-day Adventist. It's the Seventh-day Baptist. And there's many other names that this uh, the movement rears its head. And it's like, if you don't keep the Sabbath, and if you don't say Shalom, then you're in sin. That's not true according to the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the Sabbath as He did everything else. Uh, when the priests profane the Sabbath, do you know what they do? They show up to work. You should keep a rest day. Sunday's a pretty good day. I don't get to rest on Sunday. It's the busiest day of the week for me. But that's because I've been called to holy service, if that makes sense. So there's an illustration there. But our Sunday is called the Lord's Day. It is not a Christian Sabbath day. The Sabbath has been completed. It's ended. They profane the Sabbath. Verse 6, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Jesus knows what He's doing. He's going to attack their religious structure. He gave them laws to, to live by, and they trust those laws for salvation. They put those laws on people for salvation. He was attacking the problem. You honor the temple, and you honor the, ta the, the, the Sabbath, and you honor the Passover more than you do God. They were liars in their heart. They pretended to be holy, but they were not. They were wicked. So he says, I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Let me say this while we're at it. If they bring a temple back in Israel, if, if John Hagee and, and everybody else that wants to build a temple over there says, send your money, we're going to reinstate the sacrifice. That is called blasphemy. There is no more temple. There is no more sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ did it once and for all. He sacrificed one time for all sins, and He told us about it before He did it. Jesus is better than the temple. Verse 7, But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. His disciples were guiltless. They didn't break a law. He, they were condemned by the Pharisees. They didn't do any work on the Sabbath. The purpose of the law is that we would see God's mercy on us. And the purpose on the law is that we would show mercy to others. Could you imagine if somebody was sitting here bleeding out and I said, well, I can't help you because there's some law in the Bible that prohibits me from doing that today. You'd say, well, what, what good is the Bible doing me if that's the case? I mean, why, why would you let somebody die or let somebody starve? I want you to understand, Jesus is saying, show some mercy on people. Don't just say, I did the letter of the law. Show some mercy. He says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. What a statement. The Lord Jesus Christ is God of the Sabbath day. He's fulfilled the Sabbath day. We don't have to keep a Sabbath for salvation. And as a Christian, we don't have to keep it uh, to, to please the Lord. We've not been commanded that in the Bible. Look at verse 9. And when he departed thence, he went into their synagogue. So it goes on. Jesus um, knows what he's doing. He's really kind of getting under their skin. Um, he tells us in a parallel passage in Mark 2, it says, the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for Sabbath. I want you to understand, Jesus said, I gave you a rest day because I love you. I'm not telling you to keep the rest day for the rest of your life. I mean, it was a picture of Christ to come. Well, Christ has come. There is no more Sabbath day. There is no more Passover. There is no more temple. The Lord Jesus Christ has fulfilled it all. If you would go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. So, when David was hungry, he went to the house of God. That's what Jesus said. Why? What's in the house of God? Well, bread. Well, what show bread do we look for when we come to the house of God today? Well, we look for the Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, He was 
the bread. He is the bread. And also his word, which is the bread that we have to eat. In fact, in Amos, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. In the Old Testament, there was a prophecy that one day there would be a famine of the bread of the word of God. People will not be feeding themselves spiritually. They won't be close to God. Uh, now you're in John chapter 6. If you would look at verse number 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but the Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Okay, now if you guys know it, he's referencing the manna that came down. For the bread of God is He, he's talking about Himself, Jesus, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. He's talking about eternal life through the gospel. Verse 34, Then said they unto Him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus saith unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He says, if you believe on me, you'll be saved. He's given this spiritual illustration. He says, but you don't believe me. Those that come unto me are coming to the Father. You'll never be cast out. You'll never lose your salvation. Verse 37, he says, now verse 38, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. You see what Jesus is doing? He's attacking their religious structure. And he says, you, you say you worship Moses and you, you talk about the manna. He says, I am the manna. He says, I'm your spiritual manna. And if you'll just believe on me, I will give you everlasting life. When you go to the house of God, you know what we need to hear? We need to hear some bread. You know, you know what would be kind of funny if everybody showed up with a big old loaf of bread under their arm? What are you guys doing? Oh, we're here for some bread. Did you bring your loaf? I got my loaf. Took me a while to find it. Hey, honey, where'd we leave the bread? Can you give me a loaf of bread? Found my loaf. Let's go to the house. We come to the house of the Lord. We set our loaf of bread down. Last Sunday, somebody left behind a loaf of homemade bread. And they were gone. And I, I, I said, well, we, if we leave this bread here, the rats are going to get it and the roaches are going to get it. It's just going to go bad. So, I mean, I might as well eat it. And so, I mean, don't you guys do that when somebody gives you some good bread? You're like, well, let's just take a bite right now and let's eat it. I mean, now God's given us of his word. He says, this is the bread of life. The Lord Jesus Christ is the word of life. Do you go to the store and pick up some bread and stick it under your arm and you go home and you just throw it up on the counter and you leave it there for a week and you don't touch it, you don't look at it, you don't eat it? Now when it comes to the Word of God, which gives you spiritual life, it is the strength of your life, are you eating your bread? Amen. Do you eat it every day? I mean that old phrase, my daily bread. Yeah. We don't give out those daily breads because... They changed the version of the Bible they use. I'm sure if you went to whatever version they use, it no longer says daily bread because they changed their Bible version to be more popular. We need daily bread, the Word of God. We need to read Jesus every day to get closer to Him. His words are life. He's promised eternal life. If you would go back to 1 Samuel. We're almost done. I appreciate your patience. I just want to give you this thought. In a time of trouble, in a day of distress, where do you go? Whose house do you go to? Well, you ought to go to your dad's house. Your dad called. He said, come by the house. Well, I'm too busy with my friends. I'm too busy at work. I'm going to go down and see if I can meet Goliath's king. I'll go to his house in a day of distress. Oftentimes, we go in the wrong place. Now, we'll pick up where we left off in verse number 8. 1 Samuel 
21, verse number 8, And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou sawest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take it, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it me. Is that your response to the sword of the Lord, which is the Word of God? Go to Ephesians 4. Or I'm sorry, go to Hebrews 4. We'll finish there. just want to look at one verse. Go to Hebrews 4. You know, in Ephesians 6, he tells us, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So when you go to the house of God, what are you looking for? Well, there's two things that David needed that day. He needed bread and he needed a sword. There's many illustrations of what the Bible is. It's called a hammer. It's called light. It's called a shield. But here's two. It is bread for our daily provision. And it is a sword for our daily protection. When we go to the house of the Lord, are you ready for the sword? Are you ready for the bread? Look at verse number 12. For the word of God is quick, that means alive. Quick doesn't mean fast in this language, it means alive, like the quick in the dead. His word is alive and it's responsive. If it's alive as the Lord is alive right now, Jesus is alive in heaven right now, he's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living, that means he can respond to us. So when you come to the house of the Lord and you search the Lord and you come here for a blessing and you come here to bless others and you come with the right attitude, you say, God, I got this thing and I want an answer. Uh, I really believe that sometimes God answers you while you read the Bible, maybe not even through my preaching, but just through you being here, submitting to His will, sitting down with a Bible open in your lap, sometimes this living Word just jumps out, speaks at you, rattles you, and answers your questions. I really believe that. That's why I think it's important to have a copy to bring with you. I think it's very important. The Word of God is quick. And powerful. It's the most powerful thing on the earth. It's this book that's in your hand. The author is God. The author has all authority. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given you power. He's given you life. He says, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of the marrow. It's interesting that uh, it's hard to discern the difference between the soul and the spirit, but the Bible can. Uh, he's also saying, and the soul and the spirit is separate from your body parts. And it's through the Word of God that you can see yourself when you're being fleshly or when you're being spiritual. It's through listening to God's Word and studying God's Word and crying out to God sometimes that He just he hits you between your head and you're like, wait a minute, I just, got, I just had an epiphany. I understand something now. Why? Because this two-edged sword just pierced through your mind and it has spiritual power it's alive God's words are alive it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart to discern means to understand or to see see God knows what you're thinking and he knows what your intentions are I saw a child on a bike and they saw another child, and they still went over their foot. And then they tried to claim that they didn't know. Now, I saw the whole thing. I know the truth, right? Sometimes we say things, well, that's not what I meant to do. But God knows the truth. He can discern the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're doing. And this is not to be used, I mean, it should not. Let me say it this way. God doesn't really want to have to use this as a weapon against you. He wants you to pick it up and use it on yourself and fix yourself so you can go out in His authority with the living Word of God and give this to others so that they also can help themselves. The problem is people don't have any confidence in the Bible. What do you say in this one thing, am I confident? What did he say? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He said, I know that if I can get where God's people are at, where we're singing to God and we're praising God and we're being joyful and people are giving me praise reports of what God did for them, not just all the woes and the murmuring. He says, I know it will be strength for my life. It will change my spirit. It will change my attitude. 
And then the result is it may change the course of your life. Then you can walk in the spiritual man and you quit losing that battle to the old man, the physical man, the spiritual man. I, I want to give you a homework assignment if I can so that we can go now. I'd, I'd like to say this. There's more I'd like to show you in Hebrews chapter 4. Will you please read that this week? Will you make a commitment? Don't raise your hand. Don't forswear yourself. Make a commitment to read Hebrews chapter 4. In chapter 3, he leaves off of those that did not enter into the promised land because they did not believe. That's a picture of God's people are the ones that get arrest, and they're the ones that believe. And there are many that will not believe. There are many Christians that are trusting in their works, and they will fall short of the promised land of heaven. I want to encourage you, it's only through the power of the living Word of God that you can help discern whether somebody's saved or not. I want to encourage you, get closer to God through the Word. So listen, when, when trials come, when troubles come, when problems hit you in life, go to Dad's house, and what are you going to get? Get a loaf of bread and get a sword, because you're going to need them both. Lord, provide for me. Lord, protect me. And don't, don't go to the wrong house. Don't go to the wrong place. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word, and thank You for what You're doing for us. Lord, thank You for the answered prayers this week for some folks here. And Lord, we have some prayers that have been voiced tonight. Lord, I'm asking for victory. Lord, I pray that You would help us to worship You with our words. Lord, I pray that You would help us to just submit to You in our life and just trust that You're going to do something awesome. Lord, we love You so much. I pray You'd bless the soul winning this weekend. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.